OK, so we want to know. We want to know how to evaluate COPD or any obstruction or any restriction. Evaluating lung function in the lab, uh, it's unlikely that many of you will demonstrate a deficiency. Maybe you will, and that's cool. What we're going to do instead is try to simulate it. We're going to create an obstruction in lab. So where we have this somewhat normal solid black line that traces our flow uh, that should be versus volume, flow volume loop. When breathing through the mouthpiece, and we have this filter here, you put the mouthpiece on top, and that way you know that it's, it's really nice and hygienic. What you're going to do is, if you imagine this mouthpiece, this, uh, this filter, turn it towards you so you can see all the way through it, and you look at the inlet uh, head on. You're going to take a few pieces of tape, and I've got four pieces of tape here, which is overcomplicated. What we've done in the past that's really good is we've taken one and we've just blocked off half of the inlet or two thirds of the inlet and then put the mouthpiece on over top to seal it in place. And that way what you're doing is you're really drastically decreasing the diameter of that airway. So by doing that, we're replicating a large airway obstruction. It's hard to replicate a small airway obstruction from the mouth. All we can do is uh, replicate a large airway obstruction by putting tape over the mouthpiece. And so what we should see, hopefully, is drastically decreased peak expiratory flow. Right? We're creating that fixed large airway obstruction. So we should see a decrease in peak expiratory flow. And this is only going to be done at rest. We'll do the flow volume loop and have you breathe at rest. Um, it would be difficult to exercise in this condition because ventilation wants to increase quickly. Tidal volume and frequency want to increase a lot. But moving air through the small hole is very difficult. So it will be taxing if you do that. However, if you're curious, by all means, take one or two minutes at the end of lab and then try to exercise on a bike for, uh, for a minute or two and see if it feels any different. So that's the, uh, the secondary part of lab where we're, we're creating an obstruction and trying to see does our understanding of spirometry hold up. The first part of lab will be in um, just assessing the flow volume loops. You're going to do the forced vital capacity test a number of times. Um, I did a few of them at different stages during exercise. So this is a trace that I generated while making the lab book. You can see the resting force vital capacity test here. Looks pretty normal. I was happy about that, although this was like two or three years ago. But it shouldn't have hopefully changed too much. So the blue is a resting scenario in every case. And then I was interested in how the flow volume loop changed during exercise. So I started the flow volume loop um, protocol at stage one, stage two, stage three. And these are typically low, medium, moderately high exercise. It's, it's listed in your book. It's not anything too intense. And uh, compared to rest, you can see this is my pattern of breathing. This is what my breaths look like or how I handled that, uh, that exercise intensity. You can see the peak flow rate and how flow rate changes with every breath. There's an inspiration, expiration, and all of the loops are each individual breath. So you can't get any information about frequency of breathing here unless you count the number of loops. You count the number of circles, but that's really difficult. What you can get are information on flow rates, so peak flow and how flow changes with each breath. You can get information on tidal volume, the width of this loop tidal volume, the amount that you breathe in and out during each breath. And you get information on where this <coughs> sits within the lung. So where is tidal volume in relation to forced vital capacity or lung capacity? Where is it in relation to residual volume? And in many cases, you see this, um, this little red tail on these flow volume loops. At the end of the maneuver, the computer has no idea where to put your exercising flow volume loop 
in relation to rest. No idea. It knows that you're breathing in and out at a certain flow rate, but it doesn't know if your lungs are half full or quarter full or seven eighths full. And so at the end of the maneuver, it prompts you to do a maximum quick inhale as quickly as you can. And the idea is that if you do it properly and you fully fill your lungs, it can anchor the flow volume loop to a completely full lung. It says, okay, well, I know from the resting scenario, this was completely full. The end of the tail, I match up with that point, and then that places the loop somewhere within my flow volume loop. In recovery, it's a lot smaller. Interesting to see that, I think, as, uh, as you exercise. It's a slightly different take on the standard frequency and tidal volume measures that we make. So this is lab today. Force vital capacity, you're doing it during exercise and the restrictive activity, which we just saw. There are a few other ways that we can measure lung function. We used to do um, breath holds in class. Uh, we had talked about the regulation of ventilation last week. And so we wanted to see if we could try to manipulate CO2 and, and uh, measure the drive to breathe. So we'd have people hold their breath normally and then um, hyperventilate to blow off CO2 and hold your breath, hold your breath longer, and then do some jumping jacks. So create a lot of CO2 and then try to hold your breath. We don't do that anymore because it takes up too much time. But uh, it's as you would expect, the more uh, or the breath hold time <coughs> is proportional to the amount of CO2 that you would expect to generate. You could, and there's an option for this on the spirometer in lab, do what's called a maximum voluntary ventilation test, which is used to approximate exercise tolerance. Will you be able to tolerate exercise? Exercise requires high ventilation rates, very quick breathing and deep tidal volume. And so maximum voluntary ventilation is a way to assess, well, can you achieve those high breathing rates? What it does is over a course of 15 seconds, you breathe as deeply and as frequently as you can. The goal is move as much air as possible, however you want to do it. The machine will calculate how much air you move and then extrapolate that to a rate per minute. So it literally will count up the number of breaths. I had four liters, four liters, 3.8, 4.2, the amount of air moved with each breath added up together was 36 liters over 15 seconds. Extrapolated to a minute, that's 144 <laughs> liters per minute. Some people, like we talked about, can have super high ventilation rates. 140 is pretty standard. 140, 150 means normal ventilation. And this person should have no trouble exercising. If there's any symptoms or anything, you can also pull them during that 15 seconds and get a better sense of whether they will tolerate exercise well. But often, if there are symptoms, you won't see a trace like this. Instead, the person will artificially limit, or, or maybe not do it consciously, but be limited in their maximum voluntary ventilation measure. They might not be able to breathe as deeply or they might not be able to breathe as frequently. Overall, moving the most amount or the largest amount of air possible is reduced. So the same measurement here results in a much lower maximum voluntary ventilation, 72 liters per minute in this case. And so you could expect that exercise intensities requiring a higher ventilation than that won't be tolerated very well a way to help screen patients before they get into exercise to see whether they can tolerate it or not. So as far as spirometry goes in the context of COPD, we spent a lot of time talking last class about how prevalent COPD was. We know that it is, um, its con constituent disorders, if you will, are chronic bronchitis and emphysema that affect primarily the smaller airways, uh, the alveolar sacs, the alveoli, the bronchioles. It uh, limits airflow, and as the disease progresses, can affect surface area and um, 
limit gas exchange. Ultimately, gas exchange is decreased in this condition. Now, we won't have anyone that has COPD that we can measure, but we understand, hopefully, by the end of today's class, that some of the functional tests that we have at our disposal give us information that we can use to evaluate lung function. Is there an obstruction? Is there a restriction? Where might the obstruction be? How do these values compare to normal? Are you able to get as much air out in relation to your total vital capacity as a young, healthy person? So on and so forth. I don't have, I'm realizing now, a list of these normative values summarized in a table in these slides. I think there's one in lab, and if there's not one in the appendix in lab, the machine, when it prints out your values, will tell you, okay, based on your age, height, weight, sex, you should expect to have this value for FVC or this value for FEV1. And we'll compare that to the values that you register from your test. Now, the question that I have is in the last four minutes, was it worth trying to get into asthma? Asthma is often thought of as something of a uh, acute COPD. Asthmatic attacks are bronchospasms that are, are triggered acutely. And so a lot of these deficiencies can be observed during an asthma attack, but they return to normal for people that aren't um, currently susceptible or experiencing symptoms. Maybe what I'll do just briefly, I'm going to skip ahead of a lot of the, uh, the demographics and the percentages, the stats, things like that, um, and talk just about this slide, the, um, the concept of exercise-induced asthma, which happens to be particularly susceptible to cold, which for a lot of us living here, I don't know if any of you have exercise-induced asthma. I, uh, I was lucky, lucky enough not to, but you can imagine that being outside skiing in the winter or playing hockey, for instance, might trigger these attacks more often than not. And if you feel symptoms in the lab, by all means, feel free to stop. The reason for these triggers is that the susceptible lung tissue is irritated by high ventilation rates. So to articulate that, think normally. At rest, you breathe only through your nose. You don't have to move a lot of air. And that air is fully warm and fully humidified. Air moves in through the nose, fully warmed, fully humidified. And there's a theoretical point in the body where that colder, drier air coming in matches body conditions, where it becomes fully saturated, it's warm to body temperature, and we call that the isothermal boundary. This is the theoretical point along the airways where that air is now fully warmed and fully humidified. That's relatively fixed. It moves around at rest, but it's somewhere in the middle of the chest. Importantly, it's above all the small airways where the bronchospasm might be triggered during an asthma attack or during exercise-induced asthma. So exercise-induced asthma complicates this situation because not only do you breathe through your nose, but you also breathe through your mouth, the overall goal being to increase <coughs> ventilation, to increase the movement of air which is good. You need more air to renew alveolar PO2, to deliver more oxygen to the working muscles, but it has the side effect of lowering the isothermal boundary. Sure, you're renewing oxygen in the alveoli, you're renewing the supply of air, but you're also compromising the ability of the body to humidify and warm that air. You're renewing the air of the lungs in the lungs with dry, colder air more frequently. And so what happens? This isothermal boundary, this theoretical point along the airways, gets pushed down, pushed towards the smaller airways that tend to be more susceptible and can trigger uh, an asthma attack or a bronchospasm in response to the cold, dry air that's breathed in during exercise really the reason for 
exercise-induced asthma. So the bronchospasm, the irritation, triggers inflammation and constriction. You might have some extra uh, mucus production as well. Overall, the characteristic uh, small airway obstruction is, is obvious and, and prevalent. All of a sudden, exercise becomes difficult. The person might be intolerant and need to stop exercising. You might need oral steroids to open up the airways. It's a very sharp, distressing phenomenon when, uh, when triggered by high ventilation rates, especially in the cold where some people are most susceptible to these types of uh, attacks. So somewhat like acute COPD, be aware if, if you're in the lab, if you have a history of this, um, breathing through the mouthpiece is also a lot drier than just breathing through your nose and mouth. It seems like you don't ever really get to fully humidify the air because the, uh, the, the mouth, the trachea isn't set up that way. The nose is really what humidifies the air, so the air is a lot drier. And when you're sitting with that thing in, in your mouth for like 20 minutes, it's yeah, uncomfortable. So I'm only going to go through that little bit related to asthma. We'll leave everything else and uh, call it there for today, unless there are questions. If there are no questions.